It's election season and we are continuing our coverage of different candidate races. Sherry Ibarra has been serving as a state superintendent for the last two terms and she's seeking re-election for a third term. We're glad to have a conversation with her over Zoom today. Hi Sherry, thanks for joining us. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. What's your focus for the next four years? Uh, well, we're, we, you know, we have done well in education in Idaho and I'm really excited, but I really want to continue working on uh, reading achievement. Uh, that's been a huge initiative for the state of Idaho. Uh, uh, two governor's task force recommendations have uh, really uh, pinpointed uh, being proficient in reading by the end of third grade. And as a former third grade teacher, that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, another initiative uh, that I want to work on, uh, should the people of Idaho bless me with another four years, would be uh, parental involvement. Uh, you know, parents, uh, as I've been traveling the state, have been talking to me a lot about uh, how they can re-engage in their child's education. And so uh, my office is about to release a parental toolkit. Uh, with some practical strategies uh, around how parents can re-engage in their child's uh, educational career. Uh, and the third thing that uh, we'll be working and focusing on still is attracting and retaining uh, great teachers and leaders. I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard uh, that there was an educator shortage before the pandemic, uh, and that has been exasperated, uh, exasperated by the pandemic. Uh, so uh, we are going to continue uh, to make sure that we are working on uh, that educator shortage across the state, because as you are well aware, probably that uh, next to the parent, an educator is a, a highly trained, effective educator is definitely uh, a key point to a child's success in their educational career. Gotcha. Well, I'm glad you brought up some of those points. We might get to some of those things again throughout our conversation. Um, let's go back. Let's talk about the last four years. As you look back on that time, obviously COVID is the thing that has probably affected most of us. What is your proudest achievement over the last four years? Uh, I think the the one thing over the last four years, well, there's many things over the last four years, but I the, the number one thing I think is uh, when I first took office and the people of Idaho elected me, they asked me to take a look at achievement. Uh, I often heard from parents, I'm tired of being last for everything. I'm tired of being last for achievement. I'm tired of being last for funding. Uh, and so I'm proud to say to the people of Idaho, we have gone from 31st to 17th in the nation uh, for achievement. We are also fifth in the nation for college and career ready. We are number one in the nation for offering college credits to our students while they're still in high school, which saves our families hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, as their children begin to make decisions about uh, college or careers. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I just, I want to say to the voters of Idaho, stay with me uh, while I take you to top 10 in the nation, but I'm super excited about all of those uh, accomplishments. And, and one other thing that we've really worked hard on uh, is the culture, uh, the culture around education, uh, especially in my department, really making sure that we are less of a compliance agency and really focused on local control and customer service. Um. Going back to March of 2020, the COVID pandemic hits worldwide, takes us all by surprise, but that resulted in a, in a shutdown of the schools and people had very quickly had to adjust to remote learning and teachers had to adjust to that learning model very quickly. As you look back on that and how that played out, what's the big takeaway for you? The big takeaway is that parents wanted their schools open uh, and uh, that was... Uh, for me, uh, a, a pivoting moment where uh, that's why I ran my in-person learning bill and now we have in-person learning in law. Uh, it is uh, to be uh, a choice just like online or hybrid. Uh, and I know that when uh, schools closed, uh, our, our patrons and our um, communities were not very happy. The other thing is uh, I tell educators all the time, you were loved and you were missed. Uh, that public education is a choice too. Uh, and so we needed to get kids back into classrooms and we did that through my in-person learning bill. And, and then I know that we made the right decision because a couple of weeks ago, I sat around a table with some other officials to hear how we did during the pandemic. Uh, there's a, a third party looking at our data 
And uh, I'm proud to say while we did have some uh, some gaps in our achievement, uh, we did not see the slide backs that the rest of the nation saw. And someone from another state said, I'm pretty sure it's because Idaho was open and had their kids in the classrooms for the most part, besides some of those rolling closures that you saw um, due to staffing and, and, and virus transmission. But for the most part, Idaho was open. And, and we're, I'm very proud of that. In January, you talked about and, and you kind of mentioned this earlier too, uh, one of the downsides of the pandemic, at least for students, was the lower reading and test scores. Um, any comment about that? Yes. Uh, so like I said earlier to all the viewers out there who might be listening, while we did not see uh, the slide backs that some of the rest of the nation saw in learning. We did see some slight dips, but we also saw some trends uh, in our special populations. That would be our special education students, our English language learners. Uh, they had an achievement gap before the pandemic and that got bigger during the pandemic. And another group of students that we saw uh, really uh, who, who saw some, some slide backs in learning have some, some really uh, big learning achievement gaps are our incoming kindergartners. Our Idaho Reading Indicator, which is a test that we administer to all students in kindergarten through third grade, uh, has showed that over 60% of our incoming kindergartners are not ready uh, for school. And so uh, that is one of the uh, priorities that we need to work on in the state of Idaho. That is why um, you will see the ask in the budget for uh, the $47 million for um, focusing on either literacy or all day kindergarten. All day kindergarten was my next thing I wanted to get into. That's been a big priority for you. You talked about um, kids are just not ready for kindergarten. So was that the main reasoning behind the all-day kindergarten issue? So that's what we noticed is the pandemic has, has really um, affected our youngest learners. And uh, I, I want to make sure that the viewers understand that I asked for optional all-day kindergarten. Uh, that's, a, that's a parent choice, uh, but I want to make sure that the resource is available. Now, I do know as a former educator and a district office administrator that there are a lot of, of districts around the state that are already offering all day kindergarten, but not every district. And so I wanted to make sure that there was a, enough of that resource, enough funds, that if a community wants to make that choice and wants to offer all day kindergarten to their students because they are seeing the data and they are seeing their students are not performing, that they have that opportunity. So. Uh, that is why you saw uh, that ask in the budget. But again, uh, it is it is optional. Um, let's shift a little bit. You know, when we talk about education, obviously a big attention of that is on students, but teachers play a part in that as well. Um, how have teachers been negatively impacted by the pandemic? Well, I think the, the pandemic has impacted everybody, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a nurse. My husband's a, a police officer, a first responder. So um, it, it has affected all walks of life and in all sectors of business and including education. They um, were, were part of some of that, too. They weren't immune from that. But uh, as far as teachers go, you know, they had to turn on a dime. They had to go from teaching in person in a classroom to becoming online experts. Uh, and knowing how to offer um, education online to some of our youngest uh, learners, which we found out online probably wasn't the best uh, choice for uh, some of our elementary students. While it worked for some kids, it didn't work for the majority of them. Uh, so uh, teachers did a nice job. Uh, they pivoted quickly, but uh, we are seeing that they are tired. Uh, they are having to do double duty, so to speak. They are flipping back and forth between uh, showing up in person and then offering classes online or doing a little bit of both. So they have to have, uh, you know, lesson plans for kids who might be in person, kids who might be joining online or kids who might be uh, trying a little bit of both of that, which we call hybrid. Uh, so uh, they're tired um, and we need to continue to make sure that we show our support uh, and we lift them up through the pandemic, just like we have other professions. Uh, so uh, they understand that that we're behind them and we we know that um, they are one of the key indicators in their in a child's uh, educational success and throughout their career. And, and the biggest chunk of the budget request that you made was was for teacher salaries and benefits. 
Absolutely. If there's anything we learned through this pandemic, uh, we knew it before, but it's been highlighted. It's all about the people, right? Um, and, and the biggest part of the budget absolutely is for uh, our educators, our hardworking staff that work closely with our students. Uh, that's, uh, if anybody out there listening didn't know that about over 80% of the public school's budget goes to staffing. Uh, and something that we call the career ladder, which is uh, how teachers see their scheduled earned raises uh, uh, as they work uh, through the system. So uh, that is one thing that I've worked very hard uh, to keep in place is that career ladder. And that's why you will see the, the majority of the budget goes towards uh, rewarding our, our great professionals who work closely with our students, our educators. So looking ahead at Idaho's educational future, what do you see as the biggest challenge going forward? The things that we just talked about now, staffing, uh, I think that's, that's going to be one of the biggest um, hurdles in education. Um, you know, again, we're seeing staffing shortages across the nation in all walks of life, not just education, but we're also seeing it in education. Uh, there was a teacher shortage before the pandemic. There is still one and the pandemic uh, just made those shortages uh, even bigger. Uh, and that doesn't include, it, it doesn't only include teachers, it includes uh, what we call classified staff. So that would be your bus drivers, uh, your folks that you see serving food in the kitchens. It's the folks that you see in the back of the classroom working with those kids who may be struggling readers. Uh, we are seeing shortages in all walks uh, of education. So uh, we are, that is one of the biggest um, probably one of the biggest hurdles to get over as we move forward. So how do we combat that? Well, like we have been, uh, the career ladder, making sure that we keep that in place so people have hope and they know what, what their raises are coming that are scheduled. And, and there's accountability that goes along with that too. Um, respect and trust, I think, is another, uh, another piece of this puzzle moving forward. People want to be respected. They want to be, be trusted. And so we need to really be careful uh, as we uh, move through this educator shortage that we are respecting the profession uh, and that we're positive. We are role models for our children and we must uh, remain positive at all times. Uh, I had somebody say to me not too long ago, uh, you know, if you ask anybody who survived something that's been very traumatic like, like COVID, the pandemic, they say, uh, and, and they come out on top, they say the one thing I remember to do was to stay positive throughout the whole thing. So I think that uh, we need to be respectful and positive and remember that we're working with kids um, and uh, that people are tired uh, and they're doing uh, everything that they can uh, to support kids throughout their educational career. So <clears throat> this campaign, have you done much traveling throughout the state? A lot of traveling, yes. As you've talked with people, what are, what are people, what do people want? What are people thinking about on a daily basis? A lot of folks are thinking about parental involvement. Um, they said they don't want some top-down approach. They, they know that their rights are embedded in the system, but what they're really, really asking me for is a, is a better practical way to engage. Um, you know, they don't want some piece of legislation. What they want is a toolkit, like I'm about to release, of ways that parents can really get engaged uh, back in their child's uh, school career. Uh, they are concerned about the, the shortages that we're seeing in bus drivers. Um, they, they are seeing some of those staffing shortages, so that's another thing. Um, curriculum and textbooks, uh, that's a huge issue right now too. I'm sure you've heard about the CRT conversation. Folks are very nervous about that, so I wanted them to know that I've been out traveling the state as their elected uh, superintendent of public instruction visiting history classes and social studies classes and what I have seen taught is the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And, and the other thing that I've done uh, to put parents' minds at ease is I've taken our civic standards and I've removed them uh, from where they were taught uh, and put them into one nice neat little do uh, document so parents can just go to my website and see what's being taught kindergarten through 12th grade in one nice neat spot. Uh, so that they see that's very transparent and they can uh, feel good about um, what's being taught civically throughout the state of Idaho. Uh, and school choice, another, another theme that's coming out is, you know, um, they are 
uh, interested in, uh, are there still choices and options? Yes, under my leadership, I've increased school choice by over 40%. Um, and so I think that one of the great things from the pandemic that we learned is we can do a lot more online um, and offer some of those, those models of, of hybrid instruction for our kids that might have been working for that population who, who um, performed well uh, during the pandemic. So um, those are some of the things that, that parents are talking to me about. So you are one of four candidates uh, running for this position. Why are you the best candidate? Uh, I am the only educator in the race uh, with over 20 years of experience in all facets of education. Uh, one of the only ones in the nation that have served uh, in the positions that I have served, uh, like a classroom teacher, for example, you may remember, I was a vice principal and a principal, a federal programs director, a curriculum director, and now your state superintendent, uh, all before becoming uh, like I said, I served in all those positions before um, becoming a superintendent, and I'm the only certified kindergarten through 12th grade teacher in the state of Idaho, and that will primarily be um, the superintendent's focus. Uh, it, again, if I'm blessed with another four years, uh, I have done what the people of Idaho have asked me to do, and so uh, it is my hope that they will reelect me again for another four years, and I will uh, stay with me while I take us to top 10 in the nation. Well, Sherry Barr, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. I appreciate your time. Um, the, the primary is coming up on May 17th and the general election is November 8th. Um, before we wrap this up, Sherry, anything else you would like to add? Yes, I'd like to just extend a warm thank you to you for inviting me, uh, Juan. And number two, I would just ask the voters of Idaho, like the kids say, uh, vote for Sherry in the primary. Okay. All right. I'm Rhett Nelson with EastIdahoNews.com. Thanks for watching.